The time has come for my people to go. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's what the people demand, and we're gonna keep fighting till we get that land. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's time to rise to get what we want, we got to organize. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Pantsula Podcast, brought to you by the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the AAPRP, we are a mass revolutionary party uh, that was founded in 1968 by Kwame Nkrumah via the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare. Um, so for those who don't know, our objective is Pan-Africanism, um, and we define that as a total, liber- uh, total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. Uh, so those who are also not familiar with our podcast, we actually air this every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. In every episode, we typically like to dedicate to one of our ancestors. And specifically for this episode, uh, we like to dedicate to Samara and Josina Michelle, who are both a part of uh, Frilimo. Uh, Frilimo is actually the liberation front for uh, Mozambique. Um, and on this episode, our com- I have my comrades Jesse and Evan here with me. Um, and today we'll be covering the enemy, contested, and liberated zones. Um, so I think it would be best maybe if we could all take time to kind of define this, uh, essentially, because I know everyone obviously isn't, isn't familiar with that, and kind of to double back to as well, this was actually defined in the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare by Kwame Nkrumah um, in regards to these zones. Um, yeah, <laughs> Evan is holding it up there. Yeah, there we go. Um, so yeah, for me, I guess I'll go ahead and define, obviously, I think... Um, one of the most obvious ones would be a contested zone. Obviously, that's a zone where, um, you know, people are the oppressed people of the country or a nation are fighting for their liberation, essentially, to to make it eventually to get to a liberated zone. Um, now, in most cases, as Kwame Nkrumah defined it in the book of the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare, you get assistance from, um, theoretically, you should get assistance from liberated zones in that fight for liberation, essentially. Um, and we, we've seen that throughout history. Um you know, in regards to kind of going back to the the front, uh, the liberation front of Mozambique, um, when you speak of uh, Samora Michelle, um, Eduardo Madlane, uh, and others, and other comrades within the party, they got assistance from, you know, the, you know, like the Eastern Bloc of the world. You know, you think of um, also like Cuba, who helped them out as well, and uh, so many other countries in suits, you know, they got help from the liberated zone. So I think that's a good way to kind of start this off by defining that. And I guess if any other one of my comrades could kick in and um, help define the other two. Evan would probably be best suited. I'm just not yet finished with the book. Um, but oh, I, gotcha. I'm still reading uh, the revolutionary uh, warfare. I um, mean, I'm seeing the differences between contested, liberated, um, and it's obviously required reading, as you just mentioned, with the contested zones and liberated zones. It's like, it's so much further than capitalism, like understanding imperialism and just what it's like living in a society that has all of these uh, uh, realities that are not easily defined. Because um, before reading this book, I would have never known that there were these zones. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I think that's a, that's definitely a great way to, to sum it up and, and put it, but um I guess I could define like the uh, the enemy zones, uh, or enemy, the zones under enemy control, essentially. Um, obviously, it's a situation where, you know, the indigenous people don't have uh, political control um, or control of every entity within that um, society. Uh, and, and it's under the force and control of outsiders, um, which hence creates a situation in, in most cases, especially under capitalism, where oppression is there, and, uh, which creates contradictions and then leads people to um, you know, eliminate those contradictions, essentially. Um, so I guess that's in a way to sum it up. Uh, you know, I don't have the book in front of me right now. I'm just kind of going off the women. <laughs> Evan, <laughs> take it away. <laughs> yeah, I have it, have it right think, in front yeah. of me. And yeah, all, yeah. All the all, uh, criminalists that impa- for zones under enemy control, the imperialists control such zones through an administration manned by foreigners, the territory is externally subjected through a puppet government made up of local elements. The territory has been both internally and externally subjected through a settler minority government. In this territory, settlers have established the rule of a majority by a minority. There's no logic except the right of might that can accept such a situation. The predominant racial group must and will provide the government of the country. 
Settlers, provided they accept the principle of one man, one vote and majority rule, may be tolerated. But settler minority governments never. They are a dangerous anachronism. It must be swept away completely and forever. A good example, too, is to think about um, Azania, aka South Africa, where it's uh, another good example of a zone occupied by the enemy um, as well. Um, So I think that that's a good one. and I don't know if, if you're close to the liberator zone, maybe if you could uh, if you could define that from what the book says. In contrast, the liberated areas, as we see, they can be def- can collectively defined as territories where independence was secured through an armed struggle or through a positive action movement representing the majority of the population under the leadership of an anti-imperialist and well-organized mass party. A puppet regime was overthrown by the people's by a people's movement, Zanzibar, Congo, Brazzaville, Egypt. Social revolution has taken place to consolidate political independence by promoting accelerated economic development, improving working di- conditions, establishing complete freedom from dependence on foreign economic interests. Exactly. So um, I think one thing I, I think about is, um, you know, in regards to the book, and maybe we could kind of address this is, you know, how do we get from a um, a zone occupied by the enemy to a contested zone, um, you know, to, essentially a zone um, under enemy control to a contested zone. Um, how how will we say what method should be taken to get to that to that level? Well, we definitely. I mean, the reality here is that the organization of the masses um, to achieve any type of collective unification is what needs to happen. So, I mean, we're in a zone like in America, the snakes, and this mm-hmm. is a zone we don't have our freedom here. And um, the only way we can get to a place where Africa is unified is the masses of Africans um, establishing a good PE. I mean, eventually, you know, there's obviously talk of armed struggle and a lot of people hear that and there's a lot of excitement because of the idea of guns and berets uh, influenced a lot by Black Panther and everything like that. But we have to understand that having that ideological process, PE, um, or having the masses of the people in a collective mindset that's the start. I mean, this organizing work is really just to gain the masses of the people to be awareness of their state and condition. Um, Cause again, most people wouldn't even, you know, you think you're in a contested zone or you're in a, a zone where you, you, people think they just generally have freedom, not understanding that the systems um, connect. And I would say too, um, you know, I've been doing a lot of reading in this area and trying to study revolutions myself um, outside of, you know, stuff that we do in the work study. And obviously, you know, we study that within the work study process too. But um, I know for me, one thing I've been saying is obviously, like you were saying, organizing, uh, there's no uh, territory you can le- link to that became contested and then once it became a liberated zone that didn't re- belong to organization or have some organizing efforts behind it. You, know, you think of Marcus Garvey, you think about the Universal Negro Improvement for Association, um, you know, you think about uh, Secretary Ray in Guinea, you think about, uh, you know, PDG, yeah. Mill Carpal Bra, PAIGC, um, so forth and so on. Um, all of these are aligned with organizing work, you know, and I think people need to also get into the, to the element understanding that we're organizing um, or trying to become a contestant zone doesn't always mean armed struggle and even within the armed struggle um it's not just literally like you were saying you know handguns and berets you know there's other aspects to it you know you need um a way to distribute your propaganda because you understand that under in a uh, in a zone under enemy control your enemy is is (laughs) controls all the forces whether it's media and outlet all the outlets that you people consume um so you need to circumvent that some way have counter propaganda or propaganda within a party that you're spreading Right. You know, to the masses to create that consciousness, that national consciousness, um, you know, to to get them to join the organization or to even think to that, think in that way or that manner um, as well. So there's so many different elements because, you know, even now I know we're reading uh, Garvey and Garveyism and um, you see, you know, he had his different newspaper elements to get the uh, what is it? I think the Negro world. Um, uh-huh. I believe it was called, uh, you know, his newspaper that he was sending out a lot of his propaganda. So I think people have to kind of rethink and it's not as easy as it sounds that we're, <laughs> we're explaining it. It's a lot of work and effort and a lot of organizing that goes behind it, um, you know, before you can even get to a contested zone to therefore become a liberated zone. There's a lot of elements that people that people miss, I think, typically when having these conversations that don't get addressed. Um, but I think that that needs to be addressed more. Um, 
But a lot of times, too. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, like, even from what I read, even when we arrive at a liberated zone, the word continues. Like, there's no stopping there because you have to fight to continue that liberation because it's not like forces are not going to be trying to take back what you just gained. Yeah. And that's that's a good thing you you, you pointed out because uh, you start to see that there's so many elements that you're fighting especially when trying to become a contested zone, because you're not only fighting the external enemy, you're fighting an internal enemy right. enemy as well, because you have the bourgeois class in between the petty bourgeois who's, who's trying to get a piece of their pie from the ruling class, essentially. Um, and you see, even, um, you know, I was just reading a passage earlier from reading Garvey and Garveyism, and, um, you know, Garvey had a face this too, you know, in regards to the indigenous movement. Yeah, he got shot at um and everything like that people were looking to do him in his own people and he's this even is why we don't rom- romanticize revolution because yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah like it's, it's a lot of struggles that people people gloss over and then that that's one of them it's like you know you think about the black panther party and you know um you know the Cointel pro that happened that took place and it wasn't just you know uh cia externally they utilize uh members within the party um to leverage them to try to circumvent um you know, everything they were doing as well. Uh, you know, you think about, there's so many, you can even think, even when I was reading about, I've been reading about some more, uh, Michelle, who we dedicated this episode to, um, you know, for Limo, you know, they also had a plant as well, um, you know, who was who was causing uh, disturbances, um, who was part of like the Portuguese intel as well. So, you know, it happens, you know, we, we have to prepare for it. And I think even Kwame Ture even talked about there was a point in the AAPRP, there was those elements, and that, that came and then what came about out of that was the smash FBI um, <laughs> program, right. essentially okay. to uh, <laughs> to flag and see who, you know, who were the enemies so, um, or well, the infiltrators, essentially. So um, I know I took up a lot of time. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Evan, too. I definitely do. I another thing is it's not only you have to watch out for the intel and and those who are like counter revolutions within the organization. You also have to think about regards to when we're talking about liberated zones, enemy held zones and contested zones, you also have to think about like, like the, the basic material needs. So you, I, for example, if can you really have a liberated zone if if you're trying to eat or you're trying to have drink drink water or something and and then all of a sudden uh, all the truckers like decide to stop or are they Block all the food from the farm, from farms to to you. It, yet, if you don't have control of what you eat, or have control right. of what you wear, don't have control over what, uh, yeah, like if you get seized, if you just like like say the seize of like a battle stalagram with the seize during that, or right now it's the seize that's, that's going on in uh, in Yemen, or the or the blockade against Cuba. The, that if you have to, in mean, those contrasted situations, that like you have to make sure that you are able to take care of yourself. Right. And so, exactly. then you think of like workarounds like uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Vietnam, that they, they were able, the, the Viet men were able to, uh, were able to uh, transfer supplies. So, so that yeah. during the, let's go will be a contestant on what what they're able to uh, have consciousness within the people they have have the organization are able to take care of themselves. Right. Exactly. And and um you know I actually had to run real quick and get the book. I was, I was speaking about such a great book on some more um you know talk to, oh my thing is blurred out but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think I can kind of see it a little bit. Okay there we go. I think I can, I can kind of see it now but this is a great book. Um you well, know I mean, regards- I in the description no worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll put it in the description here. Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> but yeah, this is such a great book, you know, and um, understanding, you know, amongst other books I've been reading in regards to revolutions and understanding how they became contested zones. And even when they became contested zones before they became full liberated zones, like I was stating earlier, you know, they got assistance kind of similar to what you're saying, Evan, in regards to the Vietnamese struggle. Um, you know, they got assistance, like, for instance, in uh, Mozambique, they got assistance from Tanzania and Julius Nairi, um, essentially. And then they also got assistance, um, you know, once again, from the Eastern Bloc countries and stuff like that. So, you know, you always need that because you need places to get food and occupy because, you know, they're bombing a lot of times in these cases. They were, you know, um, the zones that were occupied by the Portuguese, you know, they were a lot of the times they were uh, 
they were bombed, right? Because they were engaging in armed struggle. So, you know, they bomb your crops, so you're not able to get food. So you need supplies from other places um, to essentially supplement that as well, you know? So you need assistance, you know? And, you know, a lot of people like to regurgitate, you know, I, I love John Henry Clark too, but man, listen, I don't know about the whole, okay. uh, we, we don't have no friends. I don't, <laughs> I don't <laughs> listen, Actually, listen. Yeah. yeah. If you follow the history, in the history, <laughs> you see that there are, you know, alliances that, that have been made. I yeah. mean, we can't discredit the Cubans, for instance, and just many other revolutionary uh, examples of which we have had alliances come through for us in this liberation struggle. Um, yeah. So it's very easy. And then also while hearing you talking about this, I'm thinking about the relationship to sanctions and relation. Yeah. You know, that's a very important conversation because even with public governments, that's what often is the case where there are these sanctions where you know, Venezuela, for instance, we have sanctions against all of these places in America. We, not as in <laughs> not <in the> Africa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is me. I'm not the wrong class. Don't put me in. <laughs> I'm, like, hey, I'm like, wait, not me. Not, not, my not the AAPRP. But in the snakes, um, you know, the government, any imperialist, capitalist dominant uh, force will use sanctions as an instrument to oppress the masses of the people. Um, and that comes uh, as a very important reminder that we got to fight against that. Uh, and yeah. organize our efforts against that because that's happening today. We have countries still under it. Exactly. Yeah. I'm even thinking about Guinea Bissau and um, reading, uh, you know, Return to the Source that we just read recently. And, uh, you know, he said all his guns came from the Soviet Union, <laughs> which is not right. known as, as Russia. It's like, you know, if he didn't have that help, you know, and they ran out of ammunition, ran out of guns, like, that's that's an easy defeat right there, you know, at the end of the day. So, um, unfortunately, you know, historically, we did have help and friends <laughs> you know as, as much as people want to beat that drum it's you know you look throughout history like you said cuba and angola um and just other places within south africa as well they they've they've literally laid their own people on the line for the liberation of africa so um so yeah i guess maybe we could get into you know getting from a contested zone into um a liberated zone you know maybe what in, what entails in that and i think it kind of ties in what we were talking about essentially but maybe we could dig, dig further and in regards to, um, you know, what actions need to get taken place in regards to that. I know I think um, reading Nkrumah too as well, speaking about Ghana, um, you know, they got to a point where, you know, he was, he was putting out the propaganda. He was, you know, through his newspapers and articles and things of that nature. Um, uh, I know we read about him in the past in regards to his autobiography, but I've been doing a little bit more too as, as well myself. Um, just understanding that, you know, once they got to that point and the people, the masses started organizing under his organization, the CPP, the Convention of People's Party, um, you know, they created a consciousness and started to understand that, OK, now we need to take uh, control of the political realm. Right. We need to occupy the seats <laughs> as well on the political stage. Um, so, you know, once they got to there, uh, they were able to progress. And then eventually, you know, um, the Kuma became president. Um, they, they had a. Uh, they created an environment where, um, you know, under Nkrumah called positive action, which is like civil disturbances, boycotts, things of that nature. Um, so, you know, everything is an armed struggle. You know, obviously that's a, these are all tactics and kind of going into what Malcolm X said, is like by any means necessary, you can use any tactic by any means necessary. You know, I think um, too many of us get caught up on one side or the other, think, then thinking that one tactic is the only way we're going to do it, but we should, we should utilize any tactic um, necessary. And I think Camille Carl Cabral talks about that too in a book that we just read. I think just in general, he, he said it on a few occasions that everything has to tie in to the material conditions of your people. Yes. Um, you know, I think he was talking about comparing his struggle with like either the Vietnamese, Vietnamese um, people, I believe. Um, and he said that, yeah, of course, you know, they both engage in armed struggle, but there's, there's nuances to it that don't make it essentially the same. Right. Um, but just understanding that there needs to be a process where, all right, you got your people organized, you know, you, you got, you got the, uh, the consciousness is rising, um, you know, within the state, uh, or within the country, whatever the case is. And the next step will be to take over the political realm, uh, you know, the political arenas and everything like that. So to then become a liberated zone, um, essentially. So I don't know if you guys have anything to add to that and, and how we could transition successfully from a, uh, um, you know, test his own into a liberated zone. I think to go further with your point about uh, a copy and pasting the struggle of Guinea-Bissau to the struggle in Vietnam is, and you also, uh, Cabral also mentions that even within the struggle 
against the Portuguese col- col- uh, the colonialism that there were differences there because uh, he, he, he talks about how oh, like Grove warfare, you had to go up to the mountains. Well, uh, we don't have mountains up here in Guinea-Bissau, like, but we but we were able to grab like, two thirds or three quarters of the of the land. So you, you got so it's not only not only a political matter, it's also a military matter as well that you have to understand the conditions that you play that, and especially, and especially pl- practical right right now that uh, depending on where you are, like the if you're trying to do uh, militant uh, militant tactics here in the in the snakes, it might be a little different where, right. uh, where where you ha- where the U.S. government has, has uh, spends more on military than like tent like most of the world, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That goes to highlighting the point of the tactic and strategies, like our strategies and our principles. Um, going back to armed struggle, you know, there's a big conversation about. Uh, and I definitely agree with Malcolm X and others that have disagreed with uh, Reverend Martin Luther King as using nonviolence as a, a tactic. For instance, like the principle of using understanding violence to get to gain your liberation through armed struggle, paired with uh, knowledge, you know, an organized, you know, your mental, your mind is there. Everyone in the party is studying. It's not just like you're angry and you're just on this passionate to, to kill. You understand where it's coming from. It's sourced. It's not just reactive. It's developed. Yeah. yeah. If you have an ideology behind what you're doing, you have objectives. It's like you said, it's not just some reactionary BS where you're just like, oh, yeah, like, you know, the not fucking around coalition. You're not right. Like walking around with the guns and like, yeah. Yeah, about to, yeah. Yeah, we might just get pick up guns and look cool, and then shoot our own members because we don't know how to handle guns. And it's like, yeah, it's like, <laughs> and then one of them go to the hospital. We're not organized enough to bail them out of like, jail, or if they need help, or even if you're in a you know mobilized effort. Like if you're organized, you can have the equipment to combat tear gas and stuff because all of that stuff is you know you're thinking of just the collective um, as opposed to just an individual pursuit. Because if we're going to gain liberation, we got to do it collectively. Yeah. And I think um, even in regards to strategy, I think uh, maybe we could talk about like Vanguard Party as opposed to a mass party, um, essentially a Vanguard Party. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not obviously it's opposite of a mass party where everyone in the, uh, within most people within the community um, are within the organization versus a Vanguard where there's a select few um, expressing the views and the um, objectives of, of the masses. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I think I think we've seen both be be successful in a way. Um, you think about uh, the Communist Party of China, you know, you think of the Vanguard Party, you know, you think of PIGC, you think of the Mass Party or the PDG, you think of Mass Party, whatever the case is. So, um, I don't know, maybe we could just talk about the differences and, you know, uh, and what other ways we could organize for it to be effective. We here at the a- APRP are building a Mass Party. I mean, that's the whole mm-hmm. idea. We're building this party um, so that the masses of Africans can come into this collective awareness. Uh, Because that's just the main issue right now. I think uh, not having that awareness of just what zone you're in. Again, I mean, I'm reading this. We're we're doing this this work study process, understanding it, but realizing that these connections in are, you know, interplay with our day to day lives. And since we're building this party, like when you speak of Vanguard parties, I think of uh, what's a good example. The Communist Party of China is the one that comes to mind. yeah, that's that's the that's the most uh, prevalent one I think of uh, when I think of a Vanguard party. And another point is to is to understand that that while you are right, thinking about militarily, like, uh, where which zone you're in, you also have to think about um, making sure that you have structures that that support the ideology and, and that that they work. That you understand the how they work dialectically. So, so if you so it's great if you have people who know every little bit about uh, where to shoot or how to protect the, how to protect flanks and stuff like that. But if no one knows how to grow anything or knows how to grow anything, then um, you're kind of screwed. <laughs> right. You know, you don't do? <laughs> yeah. you know, if no one knows how to, uh, no one knows any me- medical um uh, expertise that has no medical expertise then that's that's not good either so yeah exactly. it's all about making sure that you build that you're having these skills and 
it kind of goes into the whole like class suicide that there might be some people who are within a class that you might be fighting against, but they may have some of the skills that you that you need to to build them uh, infrastructure. Yeah, I guess that's that's a good um, segue maybe into you know what process do we take to vet out uh, potential infiltrators. Um, as well, like what what methods have been used in the past, or what methods do you think uh, that we collectively can do to to vet that out? And I know we we kind of read, a, um, I think it was a geopolitical piece you read on. Um, but yeah, it was a geopolitical piece that we read in regards to that. And um, I think how misogynists make good, essentially, like yeah. and informants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> People yeah. talking the loudest with nothing to offer. Uh, you know. Yeah. These are- I, I, yeah, yeah. I think the the self criticism, positive criticism, kind of segue to our last episode. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, yeah uh, I think I think that's a good way as well, uh, you know, to help out. So um, to vet those people because they may be within a party doing unprincipled things, and you know, if you point it out consistently, I think everyone in the party then kind of steps back and be like, hey, hold up. <laughs> Let's let's reevaluate this person, or let's have more one on ones with this person and figure it out, and it can help possibly even even vet vet that out. Um, you know, this is a disclaimer. You know, we don't have all the solutions. You know, if uh, if anyone watching this feels like there's something better, feel, feel free to comment. Um, but I think that for me, I think that's that's one way that we could go uh, go about it. And I think another point is to is to make sure that on the other that yes, there may be some people who or principal or who are deciding to infiltrate that you can't on the other hand go you can't, you can't be paralyzed by paranoia that you can't uh, think that just because someone has an incorrect position or they do so it makes them right. think that they're automatically an op or, or an agent that that, that, that in itself well, right. is, uh, is the way organizations fall as well not just to infiltrate but be mad, like mass like oh he, oh he says that they're wrong oh he must be CIA or oh <laughs> right, <that's laughs> right. Yeah. he must be doing something but yeah, yeah that's something about that you know. yeah because when I first joined man I probably said some CIA type things y'all he <laughs> 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 probably was like man what's wrong with this guy um I don't take me some time you know and I'm still continuing on the journey so well oh, people's but, brains have been hijacked by CIA propaganda. So it's not oh, surprising yeah. to hear people repeat CIA talking points. But mm-hmm. as you said, Evan, I mean it's there's a that's why we have this criticism process. It's like, you know, that that helps with identifying just anyone, everyone having a chance to look at what they could be improved, what can be improved and what can be sought to be corrected. Uh so it's not necessarily uh you know, people generally when they got the CIA, I mean, they've developed a very complex. I mean, if you watch a lot of movies, um, mm-hmm. you see just kind of the messages that are put in these movies subliminally. It's, I think, you can study just based off of the, the ways they've worked in the past in organizations like SNCC um, and others, where they've tried to just bring in all of this discord. You just follow the follow the patterns there. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think that that's definitely a good good way to do it, you know, studying history and understanding. Um, I know we don't, as a, as a group, as a collective, you know, we don't tend to read collectively, but I think that's something we need to engage in. And, you know, I can, that kind of ties in with joining an organization because most organizations would have some type of political education process where you would try to learn about history and um, in a proper way, not no liberal pseudo that they be teaching. <laughs> um, yeah, you're right. No CIA right. Prop- We're all right. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No CIA propaganda and like that. Um, so yeah, I think that that's definitely a way. And, um, and and I think that that's one thing that I think people undermine too much is when you're trying to progress from a situation. Um, I think in all three stages, you know, or I guess yeah, I guess moving from three stages. If I'm saying this correctly, <laughs> from a uh, you know a zone under enemy control you know, to a contested zone, to a liberated zone, essentially, uh, you know, you need to still engage in political education because, once again, the material conditions are always changing and evolving. You need to understand um, as well, not only currently, but historically, you know, and understand the mistakes and improve on that 
as well, um, which ties into like things like historical materialism, dialectical materialism, and things like that. So, um, yeah, I think it's important that, that because you know you don't want to make the same mistakes or repeat failure. I think that happens a lot. People study failure and repeat it <laughs> and think it's okay, or you know they don't study at all and they repeat failure. That's that's a big reason too. Um, so yeah, so maybe we can kind of tie in, you know, what's the importance of studying and, and you know, when you're trying to progress into um, each, each stage of succession. Well, with them, you have, you have to have, you have to have po- positivity that, you know, that even though there are going to be, uh, there's going to be discord from, from, from without and with it from within, that there have been examples where it did succeed. Yes, you have to study what the enemy is doing. You have to study to make sure you recognize some of the patterns they 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 uh they they'll use, and moments where organizations fall apart. You have to study those points, and not only historically but also things you're doing right now. Like for example, what I try to do is like sometimes read, like read stuff from like Forbes or read stuff from. Mm-hmm. Um, like say stuff from like mining or organization like mining corporations or manufacturers or uh, uh, sometimes sometimes you have to read stuff that the far right has was reading too just to make sure you knows like the ways they're trying to uh, right. infiltrate culture and like do things that uh, yeah <laughs> like exactly yeah no that 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 goes perfectly into the handbook of revolutionary warfare right. rule number one. Know the enemy. enemy. <laughs> we will know the enemy. And that's that's important. Uh, you have to understand the strategies of what they're trying to do. You have to understand imperialism, capitalism, and how it works. Um, you know, because if you don't, then you're just going to be moving off reaction and just, right. uh, you know, have no internal uh, dynamism that you have of your own um, to direct you to your objective. You're just going to be reacting to whatever they're doing because you don't know what they're doing. So you have to wait for them to do something for you to react. So instead of being proactive, you're reactive. Um, so that that's definitely an important point to to bring up too as well. You have to know the enemy um, and, and then study them. And I think sometimes people get get too afraid. Like uh, you know, uh, Kwame Ture talked about this too. I know y'all are probably sick of me talking about Kwame Ture every episode, but I'm gonna keep doing it. <laughs> that's the reason why I was here. One of the reasons. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he was uh, he was talking about he was on a plane. I believe he was on a plane and. Um, he was reading Hitler and his lady was like, Oh my God, you reading Hitler? It's like, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Did you, have you read him too? Is that, he's just like, no, what? Why are you reading Hitler? He's like, well, I have to understand. He's convinced with saying, like I said, especially I have to understand the enemy, you know, it's like, you should read him too. If you like, you hate Hitler, but you don't know why you yeah, just hate him because he will tell you to hate him, you know? Um, and that goes into Sada Shakur. It's like, you know, uh, she was saying in her autobiography, it's like, you know, anyone who essentially, I'm just summarizing anyone who, uh, let's under other people define who their enemy is. They're like foolish, essentially. Um, you know, we have to understand and, and know why is this person my enemy? You know, what are they doing that makes them my enemy? You can't, you know, it's like someone telling me before I met you, Jesse. Oh, yeah, I don't like Jesse. Why? I, don't, I just don't like him. Oh, okay. I probably shouldn't like him either. <laughs> right. right. He's probably I mean, terrible. Like, the thing is, people do I that never, too. I never talked to you. I never learned anything about you. Nothing. It's just, I'm just going off, you know, what someone else is saying. It's like, all right, okay. Uh, I think I think I should say that. that encourage that type of behavior because yeah. you're not really used to just dealing with situations head on or having struggle, um, mm-hmm. ideological struggle. People avoid it and they'll even believe that's how a lot of these organizations fall apart, as was mentioned earlier, because somebody they say, hey, you know, this person is doing this. And instead of actually going to that person directly, you choose to just be like, oh, really? And then you talk to somebody else. And then you got four people conspiring <laughs> about one person yeah. they have never spoken to directly because they've not been cultured to do so. And not mm-hmm. understanding the importance of just that that internal dynamism, as you say, like that's very important. And it can't be stressed enough. Um, if you're going to know your enemy, you got to know how they work. You got to know how they move, where they at, mm-hmm. what tactics, exactly. so that you can, you know, buffer against potential uh, you know, deliveries from them. Yeah, and it kind of ties into even now, like all the anti-China uh, China sentiments that's going Ooh, out there. Right. Um, you know, people just soaking up. Oh, why do you hate China? Oh, uh, they're people killing Uyghur. They're people. killing Muslims. Da, da, da. Well, how do you know? I, I see it on CNN. I, <laughs> you know, people just like just listening. I saw a story. Go. I saw. I heard. 
Exactly. <laughs> and even then, it's like, okay, you heard something from CNN. Why don't you engage in dialectics? Look at the positive and negative. Like, do your own study. You know, go ahead and, and look at, okay, CNN said this. Let me see what else is out there. Let me study the history of time. Let me study it. But I think that's too much for some people. And I understand the material conditions of some people. You know, you may have two or three jobs. You may be doing, you know, you may have time as much as other people to study. But I think if you really want to know these things and have an opinion on these things, it's like you should study it. Either that or kind of just don't say anything. <laughs> so, you know, you know, or just just I think that's another thing, too. People get scared of being like, well, I have to have an opinion. I can't just sit idly. It's like. Well, you also don't want to just be misinformed, say anything, you know, spread informa- misinformation, right? You know, just be out there saying anything, babbling anything. Because um, at the end of the day, that could just bite you in the, in the, in the behind. And you know, I don't think you want to do that <laughs> at the end of the day. Like, if you want to be, you know, I'm not saying you want to be right out of the time. We all make mistakes. I make plenty of mistakes. I've been wrong several times, um, you know, just. And I think, I think I'm actually talking from experience. I've spoken me prematurely on certain things, including China. Um, in the past, I've said things like, you know, that was CIA propaganda or uh, West, right. Western propaganda, essentially. <laughs> and I had to engage, in, you know, in some studying like, oh, snap. OK. All right. Now I'm starting to understand. Um, and I'll continue that that study as well. So, so yeah. And, and, and I think when you talk about uh, misinformation is that, is that especially now, especially since uh, since 45 was a uh, uh, was in office and now 46 is in office. He talked about the the, mis- the misinformation of fact checking industrial complex or something that uh, that oh this isn't true or this is true. But okay, but who, but who is saying it's true and why are they saying it? like yeah there might be some facts about why, but there's some things about wait oh, I I could have sworn I heard something different. Or- <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's like, um, you know, it's like, how do you exactly how do you know that to be true? What comprehensive study have you done or research have you done to understand that to be true? Have you looked on both sides? I mean, you have to factor all these things in uh, before you formulate an opinion, I think. Um, And I think it's I think everyone should just take time before either you know about some of these things already and you understand what the talking points are from each side and what is known facts. Um, If you don't know already, I think it's safe to just be like, hey. You know, I don't know this yet. Let me do my homework. Right. Be comfortable um, with the yeah. with the notion that you don't know. Exactly. <laughs> See, I think people in this in this society take this I don't know to so you're stupid. It's like, no, it's right. I just Well, <laughs> we we have culture, we have music telling us, you know, if you don't got this, you broke you I mean, just the yeah. the broke mentality, you know, um, or the idea that one is dumb for not knowing. I mean, if you don't mm-hmm. know, the great thing of not knowing is that you can know. You can you can get informed. Um, and then even when you know, because there are a lot of things you find out when you grow, you have to unlearn the things that you thought you knew because those things were not uh, radical in the processes of truth. It's just something you, you took in because it felt it made you feel good, but it didn't actually correspond to, you know, the material condition. So Exactly. And even in the context of what we're talking about, for like different zones and organizing, some people even look at it as like, well, if you're not going to liberate us next year, within two years, then this is no, it's so useless. <laughs> Do you want right, liberation like that? Oatmeal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what work have you done to, to liberate us? You know, are we, we going to get liberated next year? I want to get liberated next year. What's going on? Like, you know, you guys are taking too long and you guys ain't doing nothing because all you guys want to do is sit there and read and you don't want to do anything else. You don't want to... Just the amount of hate that's been coming out against people online for reading. Like, people are like, oh, what you reading for? Like, what's that going to... How is that going to solve anything? It's like... <laughs> Right. There's who, no, who there's that? no, rev- there's no revolution that I've been studying that I know of that didn't engage in any type of political education that got free from just like reacting. There's no, <laughs> if you if from you could listen like this and like that's not you can't, you can't <laughs> exactly. get free just from recording the incident and and then sharing it to your friends and being like, isn't this, a, this isn't this horrible? Yes, it's horrible. But when you read, you understand why it's been developed in that scenario. You know, this isn't none of these things are isolated. And I think with the work study process, it helps me and it helps everyone understand, like it helps you connect with us. Like this is, this is a protracted struggle and it's been going on. There's a document, it leaves a trail. Uh, and obviously the media and many forces out there are intending to just make it a charade and numb the masses of people to feel like they don't have to involve themselves in process. They don't have to actually read. They could just sit down, 
it's been done already. Look at the ones that's done it. You know, you already you you good, and that's what's just gonna cause this perpetual um, yeah, house potato. Even even, the, even even with the you talk about the insurrection, the anarchists, for example, they 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 still write too. They still have. <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah, they still do stuff. So, so, so this idea that you're not going to have any kind of study or not ha- have any kind of of a media culture of some sort to share what worked, what didn't work, what what made you cause you to have that f- sensation. It, it is 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 it's fallacious. It's 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 silly. Like don't, like don't even don't even talk yeah. those. <laughs> it's like the COINTEL Pro yeah. reads. Like they gather intelligence, they're reading, <laughs> they're reading and learning about our organization. Right. Like literally, I've read about. They know. How, <laughs> I've read about how uh, the the different central agencies were reading about Kwame Nkrumah and his books. They were literally going through his books and understanding what his thoughts were, what his objectives were. It's like that's what you have to do to understand his overthrow enemy. <laughs> it's like you have to read, and it's like also even tied into like. Uh, us getting liberated, like you know, it's a microwave ish. It's like that's that doesn't happen. It's like you think about the PAIGC, it took them 11 years. You think about um, Kwame Nkrumah, it was like eight, nine years, you know, because I think he formed the CPP in like what, uh, 47. Um, and they got, I think they wait 57, so like about 10 years is when they got free. Um, so it's just like, man, this is. <laughs> It's not overnight. People have to really understand these things before they just blurt out, you know, some reactionary babble and just say it's going to happen overnight. It doesn't happen that way. Yeah, it's a protracted struggle. It's a protracted struggle, man. Exactly. You know, it's ongoing. Um, yeah. I mean, do you guys have any last words or anything else you'd like to bring up before we uh, bring it so close? Well, oh, one last thing I'd like to bring up is is understanding, is simply understanding like what what freedom is, like what it means, at liberty. Because you you'll, you hear it all the time, like how oh, they mess with my liberty, my freedom. And <laughs> what, 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 what is it? What is it? Right. And and yeah. if you ha- and if you do feel free, like it's freedom from what? And f- like, you have to think about like positive, negative. Freedom. You also have to think about like the 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 global nature of the system. That yeah, you you might feel free. You might you might. Get, like order some something from Seamless, or you might order, or you get like uh, your iPhone, or you get some. But yeah, you, know, you feel free. You get some money, but then yeah, but someone, someone had to d- dig that mine. Someone had to Just grow the crops, and then I, I doubt they're feeling super free and right now. So. <laughs> No, that's a good. Yeah. I like that. that yeah, that's, that's a good of, point. That that just makes me, yeah. That reminds me of a conversation I had with a good friend of mine. I made that very uh, important connection because I don't think a lot, a lot of us think of that. Like the chocolate we, eat, the cars we drive, all of this stuff is um, interconnected um, to just the struggle. There are people who are picking the fruits we eat, the clothes we wear, all of this stuff, um, mm-hmm. and. We got to get free. The only way we got to get free is if we understand that there is an enemy. There is a there's an institution um, that's been around, that's been oppressing people. We got to be aware of that. Join an organization, (laughs) smashing that so that we can gradually get to a better world. That can only uh, occur the moment the masses have that awakening, that awareness Um, and yeah, so I mean that's what we're encouraging here with these podcasts and these conversations because we are understanding the more we do these studies and the conversations we have, we understand like not only is it something we have to do, it's inevitable. I mean, this is just where we are right now. And it's getting to a point where we live in we live in the snakes and we got more guns than people here. So mm-hmm. <laughs> that's just another thing that reminds me to you know, to stay on my toes with the ideological uh, program with this studying and just understanding how all of these things connect. So, mm. yeah, man, and uh, yeah, I think that was a great point you brought up, uh, Evan, in regards to you know, like people just um, you know re- defining power in regards to a, or justice or anything you want to call it like that to like just having money. Um, you know, especially with the petty bourgeois, it's kind of like you know, people, you know, even with Kanye, oh, he's worth six billion. You know, uh, it's like, <laughs> who controls those factories? You know, is he controlling, you know, uh, the materials and everything like that? Obviously, he's creating them, but who, you know, who owns Adidas owns all that, right? They own the means of production. 
Um, essentially, that's that's pretty much what I'm summing up to say. It's like, you know, power shouldn't just be defined because I get a piece of the capitalist pie. You know, it's like, I don't, you know, we don't control none of these entities. So it's obviously it's not. So you just defining power to you getting ten thousand dollars or one million dollars, whatever the case is, which is um, a needle in a haystack in comparison to the trillions and billions and the, and the people who own these institutions, um, who own these mines and these fields and the means of production is. You know, it's nothing in comparison to. This. So I think we have to un- re, uh, realign what our definition of of power and justice is and freedom essentially is, right? Because I think right now it's just warped by um, capitalist propaganda telling you, well, you know, if you're a millionaire, you're free. It's like, uh... <laughs> oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. You should be like Jay Z. You should inspire to be like any. Here it go. Uh, be inspired to be like anyone, uh, any of the statues that they prop up. You know. Yeah, exactly. And they they can't define reality for no African really. Essentially, you know, besides like a few of their family members and stuff. You know, they can't do it on a mass level. One, they don't have the 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 capital that these hyper capitalists have. You know, they have some, but they don't have trillions and billions of dollars they're not exporting labor to the mass level that they are they're not um exporting resources so that you know they don't own none of those realms so i think we have to redefine that and, and understand what it means to own the means of production what power means and how how these people how how power can just redefine um, our situation our material conditions so yeah um i guess if there's nothing else i guess that concludes this episode of the Pantula Podcast. We thank you guys for listening. Um, and like we do on the previous episodes, uh, we like to also implore you guys to help our dear comrade Jamila, who's been in the hospital since February. Uh, we're going to put a link to the donation to help with our medical expenses because we know capitalism has no heart. Um, you know, even in the, in the dire need where you require surgeries and your life's on the line, they're going to charge you at the wazoo. Um, so if you guys can help, that would be great. Uh, once again, I'll put that in the description box for anyone who wants to uh, can contribute to that as well. So, uh, yeah, we thank you again for joining and we look forward to having you on our next episode for whatever. For whatever. All right.